Welcome to These on Third Baptist Church. Stay tuned for today's previously recorded message. May this recording be a blessing to your life. week's scoop. Ease on Fair Baptist Church. Please join us for our virtual Bible study held Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. For more information, please visit easeonfairchurch.org. Sunrise Meditation Moments. On Sundays and Wednesdays, prayer begins at 5 a.m. Dial in at 319-527-2650. Ease on Fair Baptist Church. Please join us every third Sunday for communion. Ease on Fair Baptist Church. There are four ways to give. By mail, 1400 B Street, Wilmington, Delaware, 19801. Cash app, dollar sign, EFBC. Online at www.myeaseonfair.org or by phone to 302-652-9114. Join us every Sunday at 11 a.m. for a morning cup of coffee with Dr. Curry. Today, uh, we are entering into this Advent season. And while we're entering in, we're gonna do something a little different you got to come every week. You got to be stay tuned every week because we're going to be doing something different. So 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 the pastor's going to make sure he's here doing what he's supposed to do, but I have assigned some of our ministers to do some things as well. 
and what we decided to do was to do some drama as well as some music as well as the spreading of the word of God and today we are going to start off this Advent season by having our executive minister uh, to lead us with this conversation of the birth of Jesus from the angels and we're going to continue you got to come every week you got to be a part because you never know the shift in the route God is going to take as it relates to it so I don't want to waste any time I want to give her the time that she needs to bring the word of God to you today I'm coming back after she gets finished but I'm looking forward to God saying something to us during this season amen so God bless you ladies and gentlemen let's receive our executive minister Dr. Thelma Hines can we just for a moment just praise God for who he is he is the mighty God he is the everlasting father he is the prince of peace he is the great God from Zion he is the savior of our soul. He is the God who is more than enough. He is the God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. He is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel. Hallelujah. So on this morning, as the prophet Isaiah says to the people of Israel, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people god as we come before the throne of grace on this morning we come knowing that you are god that god you care about us you love us you look out for us you watch over us in spite of everything that goes on you are always on our side and you are always in our corner and so god let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart may they be acceptable in thy sight oh lord my strength and my redeemer hallelujah we're coming from luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 38 i will probably not read all those verses but those are the verses on this morning now in the sixth month the angel gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. And I'm in the New American Standard Version. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And in verse 31, he said, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end and in verse 38 mary says behold the bond slave of the lord may it be done to me according to your word hallelujah can we say amen at the word of god so the key word in the book of luke luke the physician luke the physician his jesus is the son of man Key verse is Luke 1, 3 and 4 and Luke 19 and 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The parables in the three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son is the crux of the gospel of Luke. And what is that message? That God through Christ has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke desired that his readers be assured of the events that he talks about. And so he has a universal emphasis. And if you look in the book of Luke, he states specifically that this has been accomplished, which is the perfect tense 
signifying that the things that had been accomplished or fulfilled in the past and are still in existence today. They stand accomplished. That means it's the permanence of the record. And who are the characters in the book of Luke that we are going to discuss today? We're going to talk about Mary. Her name means exalted one. And Gabriel, his name means God is great. He is the one that would announce the birth of John the forerunner. And he is the one that announces the birth of Christ, our Savior, or Jesus, Yeshua. Matthew says Christos or Christ. The Hebrew term is Meshiach, which means Messiah. Both words mean the anointed one. So Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus, our Savior, the anointed one, has come. During this Advent season, let us take a moment back in time to Palestine through the time of this events in these passages. Chuck Colson in his book, says 2,000 years ago, Palestine was a land in turmoil. It's two and a half million inhabitants bitterly divided by religion, cultural, and language barriers. An unlikely mix of Jews, Greeks, and Syrian populated the coastal towns and the fertile valleys of the ancient lands, and tensions among them often erupted in bloody clashes. It is called the time of the Pax Romana or the Peace of Rome. The wealthy Romans had lavish homes and slaves. The poor people lived in poverty. Despite all the wealth of the Roman Empire, poor people lived in poverty. Sounds familiar? COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, fake news, immorality rampant in our society, Governmental leaders no longer know what truth looks like, and religious leaders don't uphold truth either. Homelessness and the increasing divide between the have and the have nots. This is the kind of situation that Christ came in to. For Jews of the first century, marriage is not like today. It's a joining of two families, and it's a two stage process. First, you have the vows exchange and then you have that one year period of the engagement before the final home taking and this is the situation in which God sends his most precious gift his son and so what is the gift it is what is the gift something voluntarily transferred by one person to another without compensation the noun is the idea of a bestowal or donation. The verb means to bless, endow, or favor. So does Christmas and the holiday gift given make you feel anxious and pressured? According to psychology today, there are five types of givers. The status hounds, those of, those of us who buy gifts, they're for self-enhancements. It's to show our money, to show our power, or perhaps both. The gift has nothing to do with the recipient, but everything to do with me, the giver. Then you have the wolves in sheep clothing. This is the giver who likes to be thought of as a wonderful gift giver with perfectly wrapped gifts, but his or her spirit is no more genuine than the status sound. In the end, Christmas is about him or her. Then you have the power player. You know, these are perhaps the worst kinds of givers. The one who really know how to manipulate the symbolic nature of the gift. These are the people that either like to hurt us, disappoint us, or to raise us up if we're in their corner. These are the people that understand that gifts can cause us pain, and they choose gifts to do exactly that. Then you have the complainer. It is just not that you have to appreciate that the gift they give you, but that you have to listen to them talk about how they had to drive to the mall, how they had to drive around to find a parking space, how when they got to the store, the lines were long. All of this just to buy you a gift, and you're supposed to be grateful. And then, of course, you have the fifth and the genuine giver. If you are lucky enough to have one of these people in your life, it's time for rejoicing. The genuine giver gives you the gift that would give you pleasure. 
This is the exception and not the rule to gift giving. And in this story today, God is the genuine giver. And his most precious gift, his son. You see, Christ is not just another gift. See, he is not an ordinary gift. He is the child that came to dwell among us that we might have a right to the tree of life. So we know the gift was promised. Verses 31 to 33, God set the time for the gift arrival and the time had come in the story today 700 years before his coming the Lord himself will give you a sign Isaiah tells us behold a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel God with us Isaiah goes again in chapter 9 to talks about the um the gift that will come but we want to know today that the gift that comes, comes, first of all, what is his position? He is the son of God. He is the son of the most high God. He is the ruler. And what is his authority? He's seated on Israel's throne forever. He's ruler of a kingdom that will never end. Because God promised David that a seed of his would forever be on the throne. And what are the divine ties that we see today? The Holy Spirit will come and he will overshadow Mary. So, so the gift was promised and now is the time for the arrival. See, God has been silent for 400 years. The last time he spoke was in Malachi when he said to them, behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, as says the Lord of hosts. So that's what happens first in Luke. John the forerunner, or the John the baptizer shows up, but now Gabriel is telling Mary, Christ is coming. So not did only did God set the, uh, the promise, then he set the time for the gift to come. And the place, Bethlehem, Epaphratha. And then he set the people in place for the gift to be received and taken care of. A virgin has spoused to a man named Joseph of the house of David. Joseph was a direct descendant of David, as was Mary. He was of the tribe and lineage of Judah. Isaiah 11 one says what? Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So God set the time. He set the place, and he set the people, and they have now come. So Luke tells us, what did I do? I investigated. I went back to the beginning. I studied everything. I carefully developed this account so that when I tell you that the Savior has come, you can rest assured he has come. That God in the flesh, Emmanuel, showed up. 2,000 years ago, and he's still here. So not only was the gift promised, then the gift was presented. The charos moment, Greek word, not chronology, is the time when God steps out of time into time to create time. The moment of God has finally come for the long-expected Savior. Since the prophecy of him in the Garden of Eden, he, the world has been anticipating the coming of the Messiah. That moment forever changed humanity. Jesus Christ came to provide salvation for the world. The king of glory made his entrance into the world, robed in flesh as a man. He wrapped himself in strips of cloth that were commonly used at death. At his birth, Christ was wrapped in grave clothes. He came as the bread of life to those who stand in need of spiritual nourishment. He came to feed those who are and were perishing in hunger from their sins. Many will celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ, and yet they will ignore and reject the Savior. The angel declared that the child was born unto them. You see, he came for me. 
He came for you. He came for all you mankind. This was just not another gift. This was just not an ordinary gift. He came to earth so that you might live. The very foundation of Christianity rests on the reality of Christmas. The word incarnation literally means the, the act of assuming flesh whereby the Son of God voluntarily assumed the human body and nature so that he could what? Come save us. As Skinner says, God did not send Christ to us. God came to us in Christ. He became fully God and fully man. And remember what the angel told Gabriel told Mary? He said, Elizabeth has, is conceived and is having a son. And then he says, for with God, nothing is impossible. For with God, nothing is impossible. So he set the time, he set the place, and he set the people. And now we know the gift has come. So are you in an impossible job situation today? Are you faced with a pile of debt? Are you worried about your child? How about your parents? Are you overwhelmed by COVID-19? Then I'm here to remind you that the gift has come and with him nothing is impossible. Do you feel unloved? How about afraid? Do you feel lost and lonely? Are you getting tired, too tired to go on? Do you wonder if can you forgive those people who have hurt you? Ever wish that you could be happy? The gift has come. Nothing is impossible with gift. So the gift is promised, it's been given. Now, are you going to receive or reject the gift? What is your response to this gift? You can either receive him or you can reject him. There is no middle ground. Are you like Mary? Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may it be done to me according to your word. I'm willing, Lord, to do whatever you want me to do. I am selling myself to you in submissive obedience. Or maybe are you like Simeon? He had to be obedient and listening to know that Christ was the promised savior that he would see before he died. Well, maybe you're like Anna. She was married at 12, probably widowed at 19, if you know context. She spent the next 65 years in the temple waiting for what? The promise, the promised gift, the Savior. I'm here to tell you today, he has come. Are you like Joseph? Are you willing to embrace the shame? So you have to know the story because they weren't married when she, they were not officially married when she got pregnant. So, you know, people are talking about him. But, were you, but are you willing to embrace the shame to see the fulfillment of God's promise in your life? Or maybe you are like the religious elite who could echo Nathaniel's question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So you see, that's the choices we have today for the gift. We can receive him or we can reject him. For the son of man has come to seek and to save them that are lost. He came for the Samaritans. See, he came for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles. He came for the poor. He came for the rich. He came for the respectable but he came for the despised and the not so respectable. See, he came for the tax collectors. He came for the religious leaders. He came for every man and he came for every woman. He came for every child. He came for the shepherd who watched their flocks by night. He came for the men who followed the star. You see, he came for me and he came for you. Will you receive him or will you reject him? So what is this gift? He is God in human flesh. You see, God reached all the way down from the throne of heaven to the body of a teenage virgin. He entered time from eternity. The infinite became an infant just to save us, just to be Emmanuel, God with us. So can you imagine what he can do with you and in your life? 
if you would just receive him. You see, the gift was promised, it was presented, but you can either receive him or you can reject him. So during the Great Depression that hit the United States in the 1930s, a family in the Midwest struggled to put food on their table. They had no money for luxuries. One day, posters all over town announced that a circus was coming. Admission would be a dollar. A boy in the family wanted to see the show, but his father told him that he would have to earn the money on his own. The youngster had never seen a circus before, so he worked feverishly and was able to buy a ticket. On the day the circus arrived, he went to see the performers and the animals parade through town. As he watched, the clown came dancing over to him. And so the boy put his ticket in the clown's hand. Then he stood on the curb and cheered as the rest of the parade moved on. The youngster rushed home to tell his parents what he had seen and how exciting the circus was. His father listened, then took his son in his arms and said, son, you didn't see the circus. All you saw was the parade. That's the story and the parable of Christmas. Many people get excited about the festivities, but they miss the main event. During this season, let's remember what happened in a humble stable and what Jesus' birth means to us. He is just not another gift. He is no ordinary gift. This, this is Christ the King. He's the babe, the son of Mary. This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. The Son of God, this, this is the Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Will you receive him or will you reject him? As David Roper says, he who abandons himself to God will never be abandoned by God.
I said that we got another dynamic woman of God bringing the word of God and we are just honored to have her as one of our associates and she will help us with these conversations that the angels had with those who were involved in the ushering in of the Lord Jesus and this minister is none other than sister minister Cassidy the word says that everything that have breath Praise ye the Lord. So I know everybody in here got a little bit of breath. So I want to hear you praise the Lord. I can't hear you out in the parking lot, but I know if I was out in the parking lot, I'd be tooting my horn. And if I was out in the parking lot, I'd be outside of my car, actually, because the, 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 the minister of music is just so powerful, just so awesome that you just can't sit in your seat. I tried to, I know I had to be up here, but I tried to sit down. I said, you got to sit down because you got to be prepared. You got to be prepared. I just couldn't help it because he said, the word says, I never stop praising the Lord. I can never stop even trying to be prepared. I still can never stop praising the Lord. If you stop when you need him, oh my God, what you expect him to do for you? Well, I give honor to God this morning because he is truly the head of my life. I thank him for saving me. I thank him for saving little old me. I would not have ever thunk it that he would save little old me, but he did. So if anybody out there don't think he can save little old you, look at here, look at here. He can save you too. I give honor to God again, who's the, definitely the head of my life who helps me through seen and unseen dangers. I thank the Lord for my pastor this morning, give honor to him and his family and all the leadership in the rightful position, family, friends, and loved ones who may be watching somewhere, <laughs> Facebook, you may be laying in your bed watching Facebook, but it's all good. God is still good because the way technology is today, we can still get what we need. So we have to praise God for that. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you this morning with a grateful heart. I give you all glory, honor, and praise because it truly all belongs to you. I thank you for giving me this opportunity this morning to share with the people what you've shared with me. I thank you so much, God, that you have made me unique. And I appreciate that. Lord, I had struggles with that in the beginning, but I thank you for making me unique. I thank you for making us all unique. I thank you so much for your love and your patience and your peace and your kindness you have it towards your people. I thank you that the Holy Spirit is in this place this morning and has been here all day long, all week long, and he is showering down his anointing on his people today. I ask God that you would open up our hearts to receive what you have for us today. We thank you, God, for the word on this morning. We thank you, God, that it was relevant, true, and real. We thank you for the messenger on this morning. God, I give you so much glory, so much honor, and so much praise because this is the day you have made. And if nobody else rejoices, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen again. We were given the uh, instructions to speak on conversation 
between Mary and Gabriel. So, here we go. As we start this Christmas season, some of us have been thinking about what a crazy year it has been. However, it's still just a joy to know that we still have Jesus. So let's just listen in on this conversation that uh, Gabriel the angel had with Mary. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. And I'm going to be reading it from the New International Version. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at, these, at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left. That was the end of that conversation. So I was thinking about a title to my message today and had this going through my head and that going through my head and this going through my head and this way. My, and what landed in my spirit was it's between you and God. And just on a side note, Mary said yes. Okay. So it's between you and God. However you say it, you may want to say it's between me and God. It was between you and God. And Mary said yes. Some of us may have seen that show on TLC, Says Yes to the Dress. Anybody seen that but me? I don't watch it all the time, but I, I watch it sometimes because it's, you know, it's a really nice show. So the brides-to-be travel near and far to this very upscale bridal shop in New York City. I think it's called Kleinfeld Bridal. Ain't nobody going to help me. Y'all know y'all watch it. They go there to pick out their dress of their dreams. So they always take people with them, whether it's their bridal party, parents, friends. Some have even brought their future husbands with them to help them to decide on the dress of their dreams. Brides-to-be like to take a lot of people for assistance, you know, get their opinions and all that. So they discuss about what they like and what they don't like. They might not like the way it looks on her. And, and the final thing is they may not even like the price. However, everybody has an opinion but it's really only the bride's choice. It's her final say. She done took a whole bunch of people with her, but I'm gonna look at her put this dress on. Somebody might not like it. Her mama might not like it. It might be to this, it might be to that. She might like it, but because the room don't like it, she won't like it. So then, finally, when they all have agreed, this is still the bride's choice, but they all have agreed. They asked the bride to be, are you saying yes to the dress? With excitement, some of them ain't really excited because they ain't really dress they wanted, but some of them with excitement, they say yes, and everybody claps and everybody's excited, and then the show goes on to the next bride. So Mary, let's look at Mary, the bride-to-be. 
she did not have an entourage around her when angel, the angel Gabriel stopped by to announce what she was about to do. So Mary was an ordinary Jewish young woman of great faith. She loved God and she wanted to serve him. She was not very popular, but God was watching her, just as he does us. He saw her faithfulness and obedience in Mary and said, she is the one to bring the Messiah into this world. Mary's faith in God must have been strong since she recognized an angel of God right from the beginning. So think about that, who would bring such great news like that to somebody, but to recognize right from the beginning that this is an angel sent by God. So Gabriel started, you know, first off telling Mary that she was not just favored, but she was highly favored. And that the Lord was with her before even telling her what he was there for. So I think this is a very awesome way for a greeting to start by acknowledging the greatness in somebody which leaves the chances for the person to stay to listen to the rest of what they have to say. So she was a little startled, but who wouldn't be? But Gabriel did not beat around the bush. He just came straight out with it. No small talk. He said, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign forever. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. I keep repeating that part of the conversation because that's the conversation that Gabriel had with Mary. So we don't forget. He told her don't be afraid right from the beginning because she was highly favored. She wasn't just favored, she was highly favored. So Gabriel had Mary's attention. And check this out. Mary's one and only question, her one and only question, I try to find another question here, but I can't believe that, you know, the angel brought this kind of news to somebody and I only got one, but Mary had one question. She said, how will this be? How will this be since I'm a virgin? I believe that's the only problem she had because she knew she had not had experience with anybody else. I don't believe she had any doubt in her mind that it could happen. But because she knew that she wasn't, you know, hadn't been already, you know, already in, in action to do that. But all she said was, how will this be? Gabriel responded, that the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And he said, and by the way, if you don't think this is God, I just want to let you know that your elderly cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant now. So Mary got a whole lot of information in one conversation. This does not seem like it was a very long conversation between Gabriel and Mary. She heard the announcement that the Messiah was to be birthed through her, and her response was, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Yeah. Then the angel left. Now, what would you have done with that kind of announcement? Then the angel left. The angel delivered the message, and Mary accepted. She didn't ask anyone else's opinion whether she should or should not. Her response was, again, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And she took on the assignment. Reading that, it sounds very easy, but I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure Mary had a lot of stuff going in her head, but Mary didn't have an entourage of people around her to discuss it with. She may have once said something to her mama later on, I don't know, but she, right then and there, she just said, I am the Lord's servant. 
May your word to me be fulfilled. So we think about the conversation that we had and, and knowing that Mary had nobody to consult. It sounds real simple. It sounds real simple. But Mary was a poor young girl again, preparing to marry Joseph. All she did was simply believe what Gabriel, the angel of God, just told her. Imagine if you would, if you were Mary. Men too. We know y'all ain't giving birth to nobody, but remember if somebody brought you that kind of news of how you were going to, to do something so awesome, not just for yourself, but for the whole world. Imagine, now how would you handle that news? How many questions would you have had? Would you have believed it? Now we tend to question God over and over and over. I was ran out of space, I couldn't say over no more times on the paper. And over about everything. God tells us that he will take care of our situation. And in our minds we say, how? Really? And the question we are, the, the, the question that we ask the most start with the word when. Mary only had one question. Now, don't, don't get it all twisted, because I know she was shocked, but she only had one question. How will this be? She didn't say, oh, oh me, Lord, you're talking to me. <laughs> Because I've said that myself before you're talking to me. She didn't say that. She only had one question. And she only, that's the way that she, and, and, and the, the question, the way that she responded was, again, I'm just repeating that because we need to know that sometimes all our response needs to be is, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Again, easier said than done. Because a lot of times we just don't feel that we're worthy. We don't think that we can do this thing. But all we need to do is let the Lord have his way and say yes. So my question today is, what can we learn from Mary? Mary was teaching us something here. Don't talk about Mary a lot. But all of a sudden, she was great. <laughs> And see, that's what happens. You don't get talked about a lot, but all of a sudden you're great. All of a sudden you're doing great things. So we can learn some things from Mary. So what can we learn from Mary? Number one, we can learn to be prepared to be used by God. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God has a plan for all of our lives. So if we know that and believe that, we have to know that his plan must have something to do with him. We say it all the time, oh, I know the Lord has a plan for me. But if we know that, we need to be, comp we need to be prepared. So we need to stay connected to the word of God. Mary had a very low social status, but God doesn't care about that. God uses who he sees fit. I don't care. He don't care what you look like. He don't care if you're low in education. He don't care what school you went to. He don't care how many degrees you have or don't have. If he wants to use you, I want to let y'all know he's going to use you. I'm sure, you know, Mary was going on about her merry way. She was just waiting to marry her boo and look what happened. She had to have been prepared. If not, she would have asked more questions. And she would have tried, she would have tried, she would have tried to resist. I say try. Because when God wants something to happen in your life, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. He found the vessel that he knew would not resist. Wow. Wow. Now, that's some kind of God. He searched, just like we be searching for everything. He searched, and he watched, and he watched, and he watched, and he watched, and he found favor with her. 
So God says go, and most of the, most of the time our, our question should be where. All, our, all of our, all, the only question we should have is where, not why, who, and all that, just where, what you want me to do, where you want me to go. We hear it being said all the time that God equips who he calls. He equipped Mary with a perfect womb to carry Jesus. Hadn't been contaminated or touched by anything. He found the perfect womb. Uh, he, mm, he found the perfect womb to carry Jesus. That just tickled me all over again. He found the perfect womb. Never had any activity. He found the pers perfect person to carry his son. He calls us all, just so y'all know. I know y'all know, you heard it before. He calls us all, not just ministers, pastors, evangelists, deacons. This is not the only thing he calls us to do. He calls us not to just add titles to our name. He calls us sometimes to just to be kind to other people who are not kind to them. He just wants us to be prepared to be used by him. Preparation sometimes may be being faithful in your coming to church and participating in worship. Being prepared, God can see your heart, how you're pouring out your love and your joy and your appreciation to him in your worship. It's between you, oh my God, and God. It's between you and God. Mary not only teaches that the, what we should learn from Mary is to be prepared to be used by him, but we also learn from Mary that we need to continue to trust God. We say it all the time. It feels like sometimes we say the same things over and over and over again. And it's not because we didn't hear it the first time. I think we just need to be reminded over and over and over again that we need to trust God. The first part of Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God is not going to make a fool of himself. If he said it, believe it, and roll with it. Again, I understand this is more easier said than done, but sometimes we say that before we even try. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. We say it before we even try to do it. I'm sure Mary's knees were knocking at the announcement that she was about to do but she had great faith in God. I know she probably heard the stories about uh, he was coming, but she never, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure she never thunk it. I'm quite sure she never thunk it, it that it was going to be her, but she was prepared and she trusted. So we not only learn from Mary to be prepared, to be used by God and to trust God, we learn from Mary that we need to live our lives as a servant of the Lord. Remember that it is God whom we serve. Mary was living a normal life that was pleasing in God's sight, and he knew that she could handle the assignment. She must have been living right, y'all. She must have been displaying the fruit of the Spirit, as it says in Galatians 5, 22 to 23 from the New Living Translation, she must have been experiencing the distributing, displaying love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. She must have been displaying all of these characteristics even when there was no one of authority watching her. Because remember, God was watching her the whole time he had to have been watching her the whole time so all of the, the fruit of the spirit that she displayed was probably something constant and she was a young girl for the young people she was a young girl which means that god can use young people too she was a young girl so as i was finalizing this message the other day this song just came to my spirit and i'm not a singer but um, y'all can sing it with me if y'all know. I know you know it. 
but it just it just blessed me hearing the conversation and reading the conversation again between Mary and Gabriel and Mary's answer being I am the Lord's servant may your word to me be fulfilled I'll say yes Lord yes to your will and to your way I'll say yes Lord yes I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me and my whole heart I'll agree and my answer will be yes Lord yes one more time I'm feeling that I say yes Lord yes to your will and to your way I'll say yes Lord yes I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me with my Carry those words in your spirit every now and then. Or when the Lord speaks to your spirit, when the Lord comes to you with some direction, don't be afraid because he's been watching you. Don't think it's something new to God. He's been watching you. But he didn't just walk up on you because you walked in the door. He's been following you your whole life. He's been watching you come and watching you go. He's been watching you go left and he told you to go right. But he also knows that you are going to come back to him. So when you have these conversations with the Lord, with the things that we seem that's so impossible for us to do, we have to remember and no, you, you'll know that it's from God because we've been connected to God. We've been reading and studying. We've been hearing his word. We've been meditating in our spirit. You'll know, just like Mary knew that it was an angel. You'll know. Might sound, you think that didn't sound crazy to Mary? It might sound crazy to you. But you'll know in your spirit that it was from the Lord. And you should say, Yes, Lord, yes. You should say, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Because the bottom line of it all is it's between you and God. Amen.